How's it going, everybody? My name is Christopher. This is Leighton, and this is the Ustazen Show. Today, we're talking about how to choose your own dog trainer. But first, a few words from our sponsors. So as you guys all know, our main sponsor is Partners Dog Training School. Uh, best school in the country, we think, anyway. And of course, we're a little bit biased, but we have some backing to show that. Um, bring your dog to Partners. Uh, we do all sorts of training, from basic obedience to behavioral training. And of course, our doggy daycare, which has really taken shape. We've spent many, many, many thousands of dollars here over the last year building the new center. And it's uh, partly up and running, but we're pretty close to having it all finished. So yeah. that's our school. Yep, let me switch to the microphone there. Um, yeah, and then if you aren't in Arizona and you're not able to actually work with us here uh, at Partners Dog Training School in person, we also have an online application called Hey Ludwig. It's on Facebook Messenger, and basically you message it, you tell it about your dog, and then it uses your dog's behavioral traits to create personalized curriculum based on those uh, characteristics, and you can solve problems, you can teach tricks, train obedience, everything else down the line. Uh, we try to get really super in-depth and use the programs that we use at the school inside of Hey Ludwig. We package it up and, and uh, put it in a really, really nice format that makes it easy to understand and so forth. So our goal with <coughs> that is to be able to provide our experience and, and expertise uh, to basically every single dog on the planet is really the mission with Hey Ludwig. So uh, we're going to be char trying to work out a program here where we charge you know, for some people that can afford it and then for those that maybe financially can't or, or for rescues or shelters, something along those lines, try to provide that service at either a discount or for free. So really excited with what's going on with that. And without further ado, today we're talking about how to choose a dog trainer. And a lot of this is actually based on a blog post that we wrote on our um, website. And it's literally called How to Choose a Dog Trainer. If you go, there's actually a link in the description. If you're watching this on Facebook, we'll try to put it in the show notes on the other podcasts and sites. So a lot of the stuff that we're going to touch on is on uh, on that blog post. And then we'll kind of go a little bit into some more depth. So with that note, how do you choose a dog trainer? So this is actually something that comes up quite often. A lot of times I'm uh, away traveling and people ask me, so how do I find a dog trainer? And it's a real problem. It's uh, Selecting one is, is not as difficult once you use the tip that we're going to give you here tonight. But the problem is that there are just so many trainers out there. Every time, I mean, every time I look around, there's some new guy that's advertising as a dog trainer. Um, and so, you know, doing due diligence, uh, checking out the facts, making sure you check on references, uh, knowing what to look for, that's really key to finding a trainer that you can trust both with your dog as well as obviously training with your family, etc. And we're going to give you some tips tonight on, on what to look for and how to go about doing that. Yeah. <coughs> I think at the, at the end of the day, the real crucial thing is tr finding a trainer that really matches what you're looking for and can give you what you're trying to get out of it. So we talk a little uh, uh, a lot on making sure that your trainer is matching a little bit on your personality type. Now we yep. always say like you're not dating the person, but you also are, you know, going to be working with them pretty heavily for at least the next couple weeks or at least a couple days at a time in order to reach where you want to go with your dog. So it's important to be able to have um, uh, a good relationship with your trainer and be able to understand why they say things, be able to respect their opinion on certain things. Uh, because, of course, that is what you are paying for. Uh, that's why when whenever we have people that come to us for any of our programs, we try to get a little bit of an analysis on the actual client themselves, even if we don't meet them right away, and be able to match them to a trainer that we feel like is going to be the best uh, kind of bond that, that can form. Uh, so, so personality matching is a really, really crucial part, and uh, that's kind of one of the first things. Um, and also being able to match the personality of your dog with the personality mm -hmm. of the trainer. So softer dogs require a little bit softer trainers to work with them in order to be effective in what you're trying to teach them. And likewise, dogs that are a little bit more um, you know, stubborn, hard-headed, require maybe a little bit trainer, uh, a, a trainer that has A, the experience to, to confront those types of behaviors as well as the personality to not let a dog uh, get away with those types of behaviors. Yeah, talking about experience, let's look at a couple of things. So... Experience is something that can cover the gambit. It can be all the way from a dog that, uh, that to have a dog that, that that requires some behavioral training, all the way to somebody who's more experienced in a working breed or in a sport dog, 
you know, one of the uh, agility or brinkering or any of those kinds of things. And, and you know, one of the things that's kind of controversial out there, and we see it quite often as well, is that a trainer that has got working titles. So let's say, for instance, they've gone out, they've competed in French ring, or they've gone and competed in agility, or gone and competed in AKC obedience. They may not necessarily be the right trainer for you. I'm not saying that they don't have the experience, because obviously to have achieved that result, they have to have known exactly what they they are doing and, and, and have worked with a particular dog or dogs to get to that level, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be able to deal with your behavioral side. Likewise, somebody who has purely just behavioral experience, so for instance, uh, some of the trainers uh, some of the trainers at like PetSmart or Petco that are just basic obedience pet trainers, um, they may not be the right person for you if you have a working dog like a Belgian Malinois or a high drive dog or you're dealing with aggression issues because those trainers just don't have enough experience in that area. Uh, and, and to be honest, even a lot of the trainers that, that work in a, in a pet store, and we'll talk a little bit about um, you know, pricing and, and what, what pricing kind of usually refers to um, and what you usually get for, for the cost of different programs. But right. uh, also talking about experience, there's a lot of like certifications out there that I think a lot of trainers like to kind of brag about when they might not mean something or they might not they mean that you know maybe your theory or or understand like the the book side of things but you don't necessarily know how to apply that knowledge in a, in a practical manner and so the amount of time working with dogs and the amount of time that you might have spent researching like a lot of things that comes up with like veterinary behavioralists and, and so forth <laughs> is that they've done a lot of theory-based training but in terms of applying that into a practical manner um, that might be a little bit different in, in terms of every dog is going to be different so uh that's also yeah, let's another talk about thing. the vet thing just for a, for yeah. a real uh, quick question now this always brings in, in, in controversy and you know me not scared to get into controversial subjects here but you know asking a vet sometimes for a referral for a trainer is probably a really good way to start the problem is that some of the vets nowadays recommend trainers that are let's just put it this way in a, in a that, that train a specific style of training and one of the things we'll that comes to mind well, we're going to talk about it in more detail here, the different types of training. But, you know, make sure if you, if, uh, uh, if you do talk to your vet and that they do recommend a trainer, then, you know, check it out. Maybe go visit the trainer. We'll see. We'll kind of get into that a little bit more as well. Um, but don't just assume that vets know a good trainer because a lot of times they know the trainer that comes and drops their business card off at the front door. I've worked with dozens and dozens of vets over the years. We have maybe a dozen or so now that we work with on a regular basis. But sometimes, um, you know, we'll, we have about 30 right now that, that are referring us. That's great. Um, but sometimes you'll find that, that especially the newer vets, they just don't have enough background to be able to recommend a trainer that they know personally and so forth. And obviously personal information is the part that's really important to, to making a good selection. Yep. And then just on the experience side again, if someone maybe has been training dogs a long period of time, but they haven't trained that many dogs or they yeah. haven't worked with a specific type of dog. So again, we come from a, a shooting background and the biggest, you know, kind of joke in the book is like oh i've been shooting guns for 60 years and so forth which may be true and that might be correlated with your experience and, and how you know good you actually are but that doesn't necessarily correlate the two so you could be doing something for a long period of time but you might not be any better at it than someone that might be doing it for a short period of time but either has had a lot of practical knowledge and, and a lot of training so again we and, and we're just going to kind of be a little bit biased here because obviously we, we own a training school so in terms of our school, just the trainers who get to be able to even work with a client, um, you know, they've been here for usually six months to a year. In that period of time, they worked with several hundred, probably five, six hundred dogs, plus maybe even a thousand dogs by that time. Um, so that's more than probably a lot of trainers see in their entire lifetime. Yeah. There and was, there was a, a, a great, you know, I was at a conference a while back, and there was a great uh, kind of like story that happened. The guy at the conference said, Okay, there were like four or five hundred people in the room and he told everybody, okay, everyone stand up. And then everyone stood up in the room and he said, okay, those of you who tra have trained less than, I think he said a hundred dogs, you sit down. So about half the room sat down. And he said, those of you who train as a full-time career and that do nothing else, you don't have a significant other that supports you because a lot of the, for instance, a lot of the women that were there had husbands that supported them and so they were, you know, like the agility people or the sport dog people or whatever. Um, this wasn't a full-time career. And then he said, okay, you guys sit down. And then, and eventually he kind of went through and then eventually got to the end of the room and there were about 
20, 25 people in the room that were bona fide, a true full-time professional. Yep. This is their main career. They've done it. Oh, and then the other things that, that had been training for at least five years. And I was kind of stunned to see that because that shows that there's a lot of trainers out there that have certifications but have not got a lot of experience. And, and you obviously want to try and find the trainer that has the most experience. Now, that doesn't mean to say that a trainer that's new doesn't know anything. There's a really good example right now of Christian Saylor. He's a, he's a competitive shooter. And he's pretty new. He's a young kid. He's just up and coming, but he is cleaning up. And so obviously he hasn't got the experience yeah, been, of the others. He's still been competing for five years or so. Yeah. So but, it's but not he, new. He's he just went, young. He went into the East Coast this weekend and, and basically destroyed all the other much more experienced competitors. But again, so it doesn't mean, mean that it has to be somebody with a lot of experience, but you certainly want to start there and, and focus on that to yeah. start off with. Yeah. Yeah, experience doesn't necessarily uh, correlate to a, a good experience with the trainer. But it definitely is a, a at least a point to consider in your in your checking um, of the the trainer that you're wanting to work with, and then associated with that with that experience, if they are giving out quality training and, and their dogs that are, are leaving after being worked after working with them are actually improving and the clients are happy, then obviously those clients are also going to write reviews. So that's another huge thing is check reviews, check testimonials. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I think that that's it, it might seem like a little redundant because now we live in a world where you go on Amazon and there's 600 reviews and you won't even look at a product that's under 30 reviews. But that's obviously a, a really, really crucial point is making sure that the, the trainer that you're working with has those quality reviews and on different you know, platforms and so forth. But at the same time, you also need to be, you know, take every review with a little bit of a grain of salt because A, you could be seeing a one-star review from a particular client that might've worked with them. And maybe that client was just potentially unrealistic in their expectations, which also goes back to the trainer setting realistic expectations, but maybe they were just, you know, being a little bit unrealistic or maybe they're being um, a little difficult and so forth. So obviously taking every review with a grain of salt and, and negative re reviews don't necessarily mean you're going to have a negative experience, but definitely, you know, positive reviews and a lot of them are, uh, are a really, really good sign. So, you know, we have about 400 reviews across all of our different platforms. We're working to, to improve that and making that a little bit of a, you know, always we're working to improve the, the process. So we're actually we're implementing some new software here, here at the school that we'll be uh, telling everyone about pretty shortly. And with that, a huge part of the software is having surveys that go on really basically constantly out to clients to make sure that we're meeting their standards and meeting the goals that they set because we hold ourselves to those type of standards and we want to make sure that they're getting that experience across the, the whole board. So I just wanted while we're uh, chatting about this run through a couple of people that I see have joined us. Um, I see Mike Foley is there, John Murray, Chuck Calder. Uh, Brian, Dan Sherman. Wow, it's a lot of people. Um, but I wanted to mention Jim Adame. Hey, buddy, how are you doing? Diana. Uh, but I noticed earlier, let me see if I can find it here. Yeah, we had, we had, uh, this is really cool. You know, Facebook's an amazing thing. Derek Brock, there he is. So Derek, if you're hopefully, if you're watching, hey, shoot me a message and say hi. I hope you still understand English. But anyway, Derek was one of our instructors from when I was in the army in the military working dog unit from back in South Africa. Uh, he was a pretty badass kind of guy back then. He's probably become a real baby now, but I, I can say that now because I'm 12,000 miles away from him. Yep. Now, he was scary, actually, but uh, cool to see you join in, Derek, and uh, thanks for uh, looking in and for the rest of you guys as well. Um, so I want to bring up one thing as well, which we, we always talk about, and this is methods of dog training. And it's a controversial subject because there are, you know, at least four to five different approaches or techniques in training. And boy, can we get bogged down in that subject. And in fact, when Christopher had the notes for today's show and I saw that, I was like, oh, you really want to get into that subject? Well, bottom line to that is uh, techniques and training revolve around basically three or four approaches. The most simplest approach and the, the, the kind of the one that is heavily discussed is the purely positive approach. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each of them tonight, but basically purely positive is they approach it from a point they don't correct the dog at all. They basically let the dog uh, function and then when the dog does something wrong, they divert the dog to something else. 
and they try to focus on the positive. We see it occasionally with snake avoidance training. They don't want us to use a, a nick to correct the dog or to, I shouldn't say correct the dog, I'm sorry, to create a negative association. They want to basically use just a run away from it and they want to reward you for running away. And while it does sometimes work, the problem is it doesn't work on a lot of other dogs. And so you get into this controversial subject of, you know, purely positive might not be the right technique for you, especially if you want to be more, well, a and, little and bit more assertive. Well, and also purely positive requires like a ton of training. Right, and, lots of repetition. And repetition. Lots of understanding on the trainer, et cetera. Yep. Right. So, so it, it's not that it's necessarily, it, it's obviously a really good training method for certain situations and for certain types of dogs and behaviors that you're wanting to address, but it requires a lot of work on the handler side. And so what we get paid to do is a person you know, brings their dog to us. We try to instill the foundation and obedience and, and do a lot large portion of that work and, and setting up for success. And then we teach the clients how to maintain those behaviors and maintain that um, the things that we've instilled at the school for when the dog goes home or when the dog's with them alone. Uh, and that can be really difficult to do in a purely positive format. And really just purely positive in general, we don't agree with the whole philosophy because we still believe that while we might lean very heavily to reward based training and we think that it's really really powerful to create um, you know strong bonds and, and strong positive associations with the behaviors that we do want it is not good in such a way where we still believe that we should correct a dog if they are doing something that we don't want now that level of correction and that escalation of correction can be a little bit different depending on what you're trying to to address and so forth like for instance if a dog is trying to eat someone then and eat meaning in an, an aggressive way um then obviously that level of correction is going to be a little bit higher than if a dog just doesn't listen to an obedience command on the first time uh so the reason why we don't love purely positive training is because they set just a really really firm line in the ground in terms of no correction no matter what no matter what situation and we just don't really agree with that philosophy and so forth like just like you know some people when they they you know teach you, their kids you're gonna get me buried that's okay this conversation that's okay i mean i mean it's, but it's realistic right and we want to set realistic expectations if someone's looking at us as a trainer because we don't want them to come in here and, and expect that we're going to train in a purely positive format and the second that we correct the dog because of x then they you know get upset and, and so forth because that's not what we want we want to have that conversation like at adults ahead of time so we can set those expectations and if we're not the right fit for them for, for such and such a reasons then then that's fine we'll part as friends and we don't have to you know continue forward at that point but um, did you talk about uh, compulsion yeah so we're still gonna still gonna get to that so what we are basically our method there's the purely positive method and then there's compulsion on the other side of the spectrum which is basically actually you could talk a little bit more yeah so compulsion so. is basically using more in the old days we used to call it force training right now force training is a is a deceptive word because it doesn't mean to say that you're beating up on the dog it means that if you for instance if you're doing a sit training and you walk forward and you tell your dog sit and you push your dog's butt down you in effect are putting pressure on the dog so that could be seen as force training um, now obviously there's force training where people are much more aggressive and a lot more physical with dogs we don't subscribe to that uh, we prefer as Christopher said earlier on a balanced approach but sometimes force trainers and people that use a lot more compulsion will use that as a way of showing they can get a really quick result and it does get a quick result uh, probably one of the most famous trainers of old days was Keeler Bill Keeler William Keeler it was all compulsion but he was very effective he trained tens of thousands of dogs and of course nowadays you know the purely positive side of trainers they'll they'll frown upon that and look down upon that but we believe that that balanced is a way to go and and that kind of somewhere in the middle whatever you're comfortable with and obviously you know it's the same as a child if a child does something wrong do you correct the child or do you yeah. kind of like just ignore it and hope that they do it better or do you put some kind of punishment on it you know do you take away something or you know if it's a smaller child do you spank the child yeah. that's that's where this debate comes in and and the same debate with equipment and, and so forth as well and really punishment is just a it's a term right it doesn't it has like a negative connotation to it because someone thinks punishment oh that's going to be you know really uh, aggressive and, and hurtful well, social dog. media has but made it yeah, even exactly. more sensitive but in yeah. actuality like a punishment could just be something is either saying the word no or it could be you're not going to get a particular item that you might want like for instance for a child if a child loves their ipad and they don't get good grades at school then the ipad goes away that's a form of punishment you're not beating up on the child, you're not hurting the child in any way, but you're still punishing them and, and teaching them that there's something that you want, which you'll get rewarded with the iPad, and something that you want, which is the iPad, that you don't get if you're not following such and such a guidelines. Right. Um, and so that's, I think, 
it's, it's all those you know terms and expressions and connotations that are negatively portrayed in social media and in the environment that I think is mainly coming <laughs> from a lack of understanding um, rather than necessarily because you know what's funny is that inevitably <laughs> understanding we're gonna get killed on no this. but i mean uh, it's because a lot uh, of people know, that, that maybe aren't necessarily in as much the world they just think oh any type of punishment is negative because they've only heard the they've only read the headlines right, right? and so the problem with the other way is that a lot of i think people that might advertise as purely positive actually still use punishers in either their own training or their own dogs they just don't either advertise it as much or maybe they use it in a, in a different way but i've pure personally seen you know trainers that advertise as being purely positive actually use form of punishment but it could just be as simple as saying the word no um but they advertise as they're only purely positive trainers and they don't agree with such as a line of training and then they do the complete opposite so there's a little bit of disconnect there i think all right, so let's talk about a couple of other well, things. Well, real quick, so balance training. So there's compulsion on one side, which is a lot more force-based, and then there's purely positive, which is no correction at all. And then where we live is, and, and where a lot of you know the um, quality, what we consider quality trainers live, is in the balance training method. And that's where we said is you you know, lean heavily to reward-based training and you reward heavily, but if there is a, a behavior that you're not wanting, then you're going to correct that behavior. Um, and that's where we, we just don't want to, you know, lock ourselves into one way of training because we believe that every dog is different and every dog requires different methods. Some dogs you're going to get a lot more with, with, um, you know, more punish based training and some dogs are going to respond a lot better to, you know, more purely positive based training methods. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's just a matter of not limiting yourself in that aspect and really taking each dog in their own way and uh, really trying to get the, the best results and, and success with each and every dog so that uh, you can give that success to the owner. All right. On more fun subjects, because as yes. you can see, I'm not a big fan of talking about styles of training. Um, so what about going and checking out another class? Well, I love that. I think that if you are really interested in getting a good trainer for your dog, the number one thing you should do is go check out the training. Go watch them train. Yep. Take you know, Spend a few minutes. Hang out in the class. I don't know take if a single tour. good trainer... Certainly, we wouldn't do it, and, and any of the good trainers that I know that would that would not allow you to come there, they all, I mean, we're happy to, to do tours every day. As Christopher said, take a tour. Yep. Um, go out and watch classes. Uh, chat with people. There's no better reference than somebody who's just walking out of a class after having just done a class and spent good money with that instructor. Um, instructors love the fact that you pay more attention to that. Uh, pay more attention to like checking them out and so forth rather than just by, by going and reading a review online. And something just about reviews real fast I didn't mention. I'm not a big fan of Yelp reviews per personally. I think Yelp is legalized extortion. Um, they pretty much force us into having... Yeah, I know. I, should, I thought about saying that. But anyway, they, they, you have no choice but to subscribe he to said a lot that of these Yelp on things. The phone too, by the way. Yeah, I, t I tell Yelp that all the time. Uh, but their review system and their filtering system of reviews that are genuine reviews is absolute nonsense. I mean, we have studied those things. I've spent years doing it, looking at them and evaluating each one. We have dozens of clients that have written awesome reviews for us on Yelp. But because it's not a negative review, Yelp basically filters that, which is their way of, way of saying that they cut it off. So that's my opinion of Yelp. So so real quick, going back to the, the tour thing. So if you do go and take a tour of the facility and say your dog's either – going into a boarding or a daycare or, or any type of situation where you're leaving the dog there for any extended period of time. Um, here's some questions that you should ask when you go in for that process. So A, where do they sleep? And the reason why is not necessarily the, the, the quality of the actual kennels themselves, because to be honest, despite what a lot of people think, your dog really doesn't care. And <laughs> where they sleep they don't you mean they don't they care really about sleeping on a fancy mattress and bed with a little head cushion by the so way if you ever follow a, we have cameras in our kennels that i can check on and so forth at night time or whatever and you know how many times we look at the kennels and the dogs are sleeping on the concrete floor and their nice when fancy bed yeah. is right next to them yeah uh, they like the cool floor it's uh, yeah, it, dogs are dogs and and you know while it might be humanizing and it might be cool to to let them sleep on a fancy thing um, we're actually looking at, at upgrading our yep. kennels and putting in fancy glass kennels, about $100,000 worth of kennels, and the, dog and the dogs don't care. Um, but, you now, know. now, one interesting thing that I've, that I've heard is that if a dog has come out of like a shelter or rescue-type situation, the parent then believes 
if I put my dog back into a kennel that resembles the time that they spent at the shelter, then they're going to revert back on their behavior. So what's your thoughts on that? They don't care. Yeah, Dogs don't have care. a very short memory. Um, you know, there's countless examples um, um, of dogs not recalling things that have happened in the past. Now, there are exceptions, and we could probably have an entire discussion just on this alone. So how young is your youngest memory? For most people, it's around three years of age. So does uh, that mean it's like six years? Uh, three to four years. You can remember things back to that age. You can consciously remember a little bit older than that. But but people can will often tell you they remember things that have happened to them at three and four years of age. So the interesting part of that is, does that mean that something has happened to a child uh, at the age of one or two? Is that something that they can recall later? Well, if the theory of three to four applies, then they wouldn't remember something of one to two. But there are cases where uh, children have been hurt or molested or scared or have been involved in accidents at a younger age, and then they do recall something happening later on. Now, fortunately, and now with that's dogs, also our minds, like, right? Our brains right. are completely brains, different yeah. design. Um, and behavioral psychology is a fascinating world, but but in dogs, they they basically have a short memory. They remember some things, but then they move on after that. Now, having said that, and I've got to put this in here before the rescue world blows me up, there are many, many cases of dogs that have been in appalling scenarios situations abuse beaten up where those dogs do definitely remember those things later on um there's cases we actually see that as well occasionally with dogs that come in with a dog that came in a while back and the dog had a negative association with just a straight leash and collar if you show that dog a leash and collar the dog instantly became aggressive so that was a, a trigger in that dog yeah. and so you have to be very conscious of that if you're in the rescue world so even though i say they don't remember things they do remember certain things and you just don't know when they're going to remember that but as far as you know a metal cage um, or... you know if you take a dog that was raised in a reservation a lot of those dogs are, are malnourished or not looked after and so forth they adjust really quickly to a home environment in a positive or a place where they have a lot of food you know if you look at dogs in mexico go down travel around there uh, those dogs are pretty happy actually it's kind of funny to see some of them um, and one of the things i hate about saying what i'm saying right now is i'm generalizing because obviously there's exceptions to all the rules but but the you know going back to the behavior and what they recall um no if your dog was in a shelter and you put the dog back in a kennel here in this environment it's not the same thing in our environment the dogs are active they're taken out of their kennels every day they're outside of the play groups they're in socialization sessions they're in training sessions uh, we bring them back and forth for feeding time so there's there's multiple times during the day that they are having positive interactions and so the little bit of time that they're in the kennel for the most part there are exceptions but for the most part is not a factor and if they are in their kennel they're usually basically passing out like yeah they, because at the end of the day they're them. tired um it's been a hectic day i mean it's kind of funny you guys if you're watching last week we had our little uh, my little yorkie my daughter's yorkie here with us um and it's funny because now that the weather's really nice outside she often hangs out outside with our big dogs in their exercise areas and now when she comes in at, at nighttime she's exhausted she just passes out mm -hmm. and it's it's exactly what we talk about that's the whole point of daycare and of socialization and of interaction with other dogs. And we're actually going to be talking about socialization next week, right? Yep. So we're yep. going to do, uh, uh, I don't know how many parts to the series yet, maybe like three or four parts of, of specifically socialization, socialization with dogs, socialization to people, you know, just inanimate objects to the world around them, to your home. We're going to cover all those things in, in pretty good depth. So um, a couple questions going back to the, the tour, if you are taking a tour, where the dogs are sleeping obviously is one. Now, if they are sleeping in crates, we prefer to try and not let the dogs sleep in a crate especially if they're there for a long period of time just because they usually don't have as much room as like for example like full-on kennels where they have maybe four to six feet to, to move around or to to potty if they are going to be staying there overnight and then there's not a person letting them out at night and they can at least potty in one side of the kennel and, and not have to sleep in their potty and potentially and, and most of our dogs make it all the way through the night so yeah. we we normally pack up around between five and six uh, the Wake techs up. go home, and in the morning they're here at seven. seven. Yeah. Um, and most dogs are fine doing that. Same as your dogs at home, they can make it for you yeah. know ten, twelve hours without any issue. Uh, but obviously, if they do need to go potty, then they need to be in a different area. And having a dog in a crate is not a good idea overnight, eh, within certain reasons. Obviously, at home it's a, it's a lot shorter period. But and um, then, so yeah. those 
kennels also need to be really cleaned and sanitized every single day. Yep. There's a lot of, you know, again, if you're having a lot of dogs coming through there, we do our best. We check vaccinations, at least we do, on every single dog that comes in. We verify that with the vet. We don't let any dogs that come in here that are under 20 weeks. Most schools only make it 16 weeks. We've gone a little bit more because we found that if we go, you know, one or two weeks extra, then you're able to get a lot better, um, you know, results in terms of not letting a, a thing like kennel cough come in. Now, kennel cough is still, it's like the, basically a puppy cold. Um, it's still a huge possibility for really any type of kennel situation because you can't eliminate it altogether. Um, but we do like have specific areas. Like if we do have a, a dog that comes down with kennel cough, like um, isolation they have a, area. Yeah, it, it, we call it our it's VIP area where they're kept separate from any of the other dogs. They, when they get let outside, they're kept separate. If any equipment is used with them, that equipment gets sprayed down with a special cleaner called brew clean, which is meant to eliminate those types of, um, of, uh, uh bacteria. And, but in our main kennels, those are cleaned, bleached, sanitized every single day. So that it tries to eliminate as many, um, you know, chances of, of contracting anything as possible. Um, and you know, some kennels don't do that, which we just, we just recommend at least every single day. Actually, I think we even do it a couple times a day now. We yeah, we actually, we actually have takes that go in now as well after lunch. The cleaner we can keep the kennels, the better it is for us as trainers. And then also it's good experience for the dogs to, to constantly be interacting with our staff and with our training staff. And, and that's one of the advantages of a big school like ours is that we have a lot of different people that do different things. Yep. And then just kind of hammering through the rest of this list real quick is the, the place climate control. So you want to make sure that they, they keep it nice and cool, especially here in the summer. That's obviously a, a really big thing. Um, is it quiet? So again, if you're, if your dog is in a really, really loud environment for that entire period of time, if they're here for two or three weeks at a time, sometimes during the board and train programs, the, the amount of noise that happens overnight can potentially make your dog obviously not be able to sleep. And then that restlessness can play out in terms of, um, you know, making you know, their experience less and then they could potentially contract um, some type of diseases because their immune systems weakened, weakened and so forth. So you want to make sure that the place is as quiet as possible, um, both to outside noise as well as, as internally as, as best as you can. That's why we don't have people actually inside the kennels while we have, you know, us on the property. We live on the property at all times. We don't have, um, you know, staff walking through the kennels at night because we try to keep it as quiet as possible. Uh, safety protocols, if there is a power outage, obviously that has the potential of happening no matter where you are. So you wanna make sure that the place has the ability to run on a power outage. We have, I think two, do we have two generators or one generator? We have two generators. Have one two is generators. a, it doesn't run our air conditioning system, but our building is heavily insulated. Yep. So yep. R50 so even, insulation. Yep. And, and we actually, I don't know if you can see this on the camera. I'll see if I can, uh, that's actually, a, there we go there that's actually what our tracking system looks like that tracks the uh the cooling and the um and the fil the uh, air circulation system in the kennels um i can track this pretty much from anywhere in the world uh i have sensors that i've set up uh For on this and, and another one that can trigger if uh if it goes above a certain temperature or below a certain temperature if the power goes out it sends me a notification uh, I was actually down in Florida a couple of weeks ago, and the power went out. And I called, um, I called the manager before she even realized that the power was out. Uh, and within about 30 seconds, um, it was a it was a state uh, an area wide outage. But we have protocols in place to take into that into yep. account if that should happen. And, and uh, even with all the air conditioning down in the middle of the summer, literally our place doesn't get above yep. I think 78 degrees because it's so well insulated. We have 13, 14 inch concrete walls. Um, to make sure that, that stays nice and cool, even if there's no air conditioning running. So uh, another big thing is asking like what happens with the dog during the day. So a lot of places, again, maybe they're just leaving the dog in the kennel throughout the entire day. We personally think that dogs should have a little bit of activity. Now there's yep. different programs and so forth, additional services that you can purchase if you want like your dog to go into daycare, or if you want your dog to get training during the day. Um, but at minimum, we try to let the dogs at least spend some time outside. As it gets hotter, that becomes a little bit less frequent. Uh, but we still try to give them as much exercise as we can. And so uh, we definitely you want to make sure that you're asking what the dog's day is going to look like and, and so forth, how they spend their entire day. Uh, and, and just because a kennel doesn't have some of these features doesn't make them a bad kennel or just because they, yeah. in fact, most training schools, you know, we're one of the few large schools that has has a big facility. Um, most places don't have what we have. So you just got to decide for yourself well, that's whether the thing, that's important ask or not. about it. And then it, 
depending on their answer is is kind of how you should obviously you know take it into your own account i want to ask you guys a favor so i'm watching on my on my one laptop here and it says um, a number of people have joined but when we look at the main thing then we generally are revolving around like six, eight people following and so forth. I think a lot of you guys are following on my personal page, which is awesome. But do me a favor. Will you just throw a message at me there on, on wherever you're watching? Just say watching or whatever the case is. Because it's really hard to tell where you guys are sending or watching us from, whether it's my personal page or from the school page. Yep. Um, and then I want to cover a question that Michael uh, sent us earlier on. So can we talk about the difference between training big dogs versus training small toy breeds now it's actually interesting because yeah, we'll probably go more in deep to, in depth than that on, a, on another day yeah i'll just touch on that real real quick because it actually kind of ties in there are some training schools that won't train small dogs yep. um they believe and some small price dogs, differently yeah they, they believe still dogs are just not that trainable which is somewhat true but you can still train them um you can use a lot of the softer techniques you've got to be much more gentle on the drug use a lot of food reward based training um you can use clicker tra type training on it gary wilkes system clicker training and um and then of course with big dogs uh, you know you got to look at the personality it's not so much about the size of the dog it's more about the personality that you're training of course what your expectations are um and we'll discuss that another time when we get into the the, the maybe specific things i want to stick tonight to the yeah to the uh, selection of a kennel. So another big question um, that we recommend you, you asking is kind of getting an idea of what their team look like, uh, looks like. So there's a couple different styles in terms of the trainers that we see here in Arizona. You have the one man shows, which basically, you know, is a, is a single trainer that basically does everything. And so we'll talk a little bit about what a day might look like for that person. And, and you need to kind of assess for yourself if that's going to you know, qualify. And then you have a, a full on team, which is something that we've you know, focused on heavily on here to make sure that everything gets done right and all the animals are taken care of. So for, you know, and again, this is basically just you can decide for yourself. Basically, on the given day, a, a single man person has to you know, clean the kennels, answer the phones, making sure that they're keeping in contact with you you know, write the notes on the dogs so that they can, you know, have a, a timeline of what was worked on with each dog so that they can get an idea of, you know, what to maybe address next or if there's any, you know, specific thing that they want to remember to touch on with you. Again, remember making sure that you being a part of your dog's training is a most important step. It doesn't matter what your, your trainer can do for your dog. You can, you know, we always say you can teach them to sit on their head and sing the ABCs, but if your dog does the same thing when they go home, you're not going to be very happy with that. So yeah. you being a part of that training is really crucial and your trainer writing notes on the dog so that they can touch on those specific things because otherwise you forget and then, you know, those things aren't addressed and so forth. And let me, I want to touch on that subject as well because it came up the other day in a conversation with a client where they said, well, we thought we had, if we brought the dog to you that we wouldn't have to do any other training. Well, that's kind of like taking your dog into a mechanic and having them fix something on the car but you not knowing how to drive the car you still got to do your work and if you don't know how to drive the car if you don't know how to check your you know your wheels or your tires or your whatever air pressures uh put in gas etc then you're going to have a hard time driving so so training sure you can use us and we actually encourage people to use us to do the basic training set the foundation set the the behaviors to do the exposure to other dogs maybe socialization etc but you're going to have to follow up later on with your training because we obviously don't live in your own home yep uh you know someone that does the the check-ins that takes the dogs outside to go potty bathes the dogs trains the dogs obviously at the end of the day and so if you have all those different steps the reason why we prefer to have a team is because for the dogs that stay with us we have two to three people every single day that their only job is in we call them animal care technicians their only job is to make sure a the dogs are are you know good on food good on water that they're being rotated in and outside to go potty and, and to you know have enough exercise throughout the day they clean the kennels they make sure that all the meds are done they bathe the dogs when they go home so all those things have to be done and like i said we have two to three people that do them every single day they clean the facility they make sure everything's kept nice and and, um, and orderly and so forth um, that's very difficult for one person to do if they're having a, a couple dogs stay with them. Now, obviously, the, the person that is only training one dog might only have three or four or five dogs at a time, but that's still you know a lot of work that that can be that has to be done when in actuality they need to be focused on training your dog. So we have a team of people that only do the animal care stuff, and then we have the trainers, and then we have the instructors that work one on one with the clients and so forth. And each individual person has their role to make sure that your experience. And your dog's experience is is optimal and that you're getting the the results that you're looking for and, and so forth so 
um, you know, like I said, you know, we have a team, their office staff of, of four or five people at any one time, making sure, you know, all the vaccinations are checked on every single dog, making sure we have stays in constant communication with you. Um, you know, again, going back to animal care technicians, they they weigh the dogs almost every day or every other day just to make sure that the dog's not losing weight. So when your state, when your dog stays in a, in a kennel environment, they're usually getting a lot more activity and they're usually um, doing a lot more than what they would be doing at your house. And so inevitably they end up losing a little bit of weight. Now, in some cases that might be a good thing. Maybe your dog was a little bit overweight coming in here, but not, in that, cases, we'd ever, not that we'd ever say that, right? Yeah. Well, that's actually one of the questions on our, um, uh, on our what we call a doggy data packet, which is all the information we get on your dog, so that the trainers and so forth have a very clear, um, you know, communication between you and what you're looking for. But one of the questions on there is, do you believe your dog's underweight or overweight, and so forth? And we can <laughs> help address that because there are dogs that come in here either underweight and so forth, and maybe need to be fed a little bit more, especially and, if they're in a high active environment. And almost every client tells us their dog is not overweight. Meantime, in many cases, it is. Yeah. So, so you know, making sure that we weigh your dogs every single day, that's a nice thing about the new software we're going to is it makes it really, really clear if a dog is losing a little bit of weight, even just a, a few percentage points. Um, you know, writing notes on the dog so that the training stays consistent. We have multiple trainers that work with one dog that stays here on any given, you know, experience. And the reason why we do that is because if one dog works with one trainer for two or three weeks at a time, the dog inev inevitably ends up working really, really well for that one trainer. But then when you try to transition that training over to a different person, and that different person is usually you, um, then, then it doesn't apply usually as well. And so with us, we have a team of, you know, 10 to 12 trainers that will work with your dog while they're here obviously making sure that each you know problem that you're trying to address is is addressable with each trainer that they have the experience for it um but that's so that they can that the dog learns to listen to everyone and not just one person not just develop one bond with one person um and so that's really really critical obviously you know making sure that the you know uh, the bathing is getting done again the the communication between you checking your dog in and out so that you're not wasting your time and so forth um, all that stuff is really critical and that's why we have a, a team that handles it all so last week after the show i got somebody sent me a message and said how come you look so big and yeah. i look so small in the picture is that because and he's talking about big because i because i work out is that yeah right so i just want to point out you guys can't see it but down here christopher's got like a wooden board that raises him up about an it's inch and and it's and not I even, try to, it's a quarter of an I inch. try to give him take it out. I think it's this dominance thing, you know, like the young little uh, have you ever read the story of a of like who was it? It was the, the the news reporter now. I can't think of his name. Uh Anderson Cooper, right? Oh really? I think he had a thing where he would set his office chair like six inches and then the other chairs in his office would be lowered intentionally so that he would always be a So you a see, tall... it is, there is something to that. Yeah. So there is something the, to it, know, but I, those... I have no problem with my confidence level. I'm, I'm still, I'm still totally It's interested. honestly just because all the all right. stuff is on Let's top. wrap this up tonight. Hey well, guys, well, thanks. Well, 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 one last thing. So price. So price is a really, really important thing to, to talk about. And the reason why is because not every single trainer is going to be priced the same. And usually when it comes down to it, you get what you pay for. Um, it's just like any other thing. But the really critical part about this is you're not just paying for a product that you might use for two or three years. You're paying for a relationship with your dog that's going to last 10 years, 12 years, 13, 14, 15 years at a time. And so the foundation and so forth that you're putting in now, the two to three weeks of work that you put in today and maybe the couple thousand dollars that it might be today is going to last with you for the rest of your life. And I promise the heartache and, you know, we've had people that, that come in here where they're literally about to get divorced because of a dog or they're wanting to get rid of the dog and the kids are crying and the parents are crying. That stuff is not worth you know, one or two thousand dollars in order to get the training that your dog needs to have a happier life for your dog as well as a happier life for you and your family. Um, so that's why, you know, we always recommend not just going for the cheapest rate. Now, obviously, you still have to remain within your budget. And, and we do some things here at the school, like we have a, a financing option where you can pay for, you know, get training today and then pay over six months and with no interest and so forth. Because we do really want to get you the help and get your dog the help that you guys need, um, despite maybe financial capabilities. But uh, at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you're not just going for the PetSmart trainer that might be 300 bucks or the the pickup dog trainer that uh, that rolls up in his pickup truck. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with PetSmart's training. It's just they focus more on the 
the puppy obedience and the soft pet obedience, they don't get into any of the serious behavioral stuff. Yeah. I've got a question here from Michael. Uh, he sent us a great question, and I skipped over it by mistake. Uh, he said, do we have a vet or a DVM uh, on call? Uh, we actually have multiple vets. We probably have, I think, five or six vets that we can call on. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we have multiple vets is because if we need to get a dog into a vet, we need to get him away straight away. Yeah, a couple yeah. of them are 24 hours. Uh, pet urgent care is 24 hours. Um, uh, animal health services up in Cape Creek or Carefree is uh, 24 hours. Um, and uh, and then, of course, the um, uh, Dr. Brett, uh, Brett, Brett, Vet, Brett, Brett the Vet. Brett the Vet. I say that fast. Uh, Brett the Vet is, uh, is sort of our go-to guy. Um, we can normally get a dog in there pretty quickly if we need to. Um, and then we do also have Dr. Sickler that will come here to the school in case we have a situation where we don't want to take a dog to a vet or it's easier to get a vet to come here. So uh, it's best to have a really good relationship with a whole bunch of different people. And then that way, you know, if somebody's not available or the vet's out of town or something like that, you've got somebody you can go to. Yep. All right. All right. So that is the the end of how to choose a dog trainer. Again, if you want to, you know, go over any of these lists and so forth, we wrote a blog on our website. It's linked in the description below. Uh, and then one other couple quick announcements. So this coming Saturday, which is the which is April twentieth, twentieth, um, we are doing an Easter doggy photo shoot here at the school. Um, so if you live in Arizona and you're near it, or at least in you know a close distance to us at the school, come down. It's free photos of your dog. You get to kind of hang out with us for a little bit, and then also you know get some really really cool photos um, of your pup. And then some other things where, like I said, we're expanding the daycare, so look out for some announcements on that. And then we're also going to some potentially new software that will make it really really simple for for our clients to access information, to purchase you know additional services, to really make their entire experience a lot and to make bookings so and reservations yeah, with bookings, us reservations and so forth everything like that just to really provide